Welcome everyone. It's great to see such a great crowd and such an interdisciplinary crowd, which is one of the aims of these uh, lectures. We knew today that we were competing against seriously good weather, so <laughs> it was, you know, between this lecture and Johnson Green, we're a nice patio. So great to, great to have you all out. And this is our last uh, se uh, seminar in the series for the semester, but we will be um, having the series start up again in, in September in the fall semester. And so I just wanted to thank Lauren, who's my um, uh, partner in crime in organizing the series. Um, it's, it's been a great uh, but it's been a great run this semester, and uh, we look forward to the semester starting up again in the fall. And so I'll just uh, pass um, uh, uh, the mic over to uh, Dean uh, Carrie Daly, the Dean of the College of Social and Applied Human Sciences, who is also our host for the seminar series. So thanks very much, Carrie, for for. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you, Gary. Uh, when you're talking about the competition with Johnson Green, it sounded a little bit like Air Canada. You know, saying, you know, thank you for flying with us. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it is a pleasure for me to introduce these two fine scholars that are going to be uh, talking uh, with us today. Um, the first on my left, Ale Alexander Leguigo is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Geography. He was educated in Cameroon and the United Kingdom. Uh, Alexander has a very strong interest in urbanization, food insecurity, and complex social environmental systems. His research focuses on urban food security in Botswana specifically, and Alexander is interested in understanding the factors driving differential access to food within increasingly urban uh, uh, urban sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Alice Havorka, also from uh, the Department of Geography, uh, where she's a, an associate professor. Uh, her research focuses on contemporary human environment relations in southern Africa, a region where lives, circumstances, and landscapes have undergone rapid transformation within the past generation. Specifically, Alice explores how relations of power operate to create spaces of opportunity and or constraint for different social groups. Past and current studies include issues associated with housing access, urban agriculture and food security, resource use, entrepreneurship, identity politics, and human-animal relationships, primarily in and around Garboni, Botswana. So, welcome to both of you. And there will be an opportunity for uh, discussion and questions at the end. So, over to you. Thank Here's you. the mic. <laughs> um, can everyone hear me if I'm speaking at this level? We're all good? Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming in light of the weather. Um, thank you very much for the introductions from Carrie and Carrie. Um, <laughs> The research that we're sharing with you today is a culmination of two things. On the one hand, uh, my long-standing interest in contemporary urban life in Southern Africa, and very specifically Botswana, and, and on the other hand, and primarily, the hard work, dedication, and insights that Alexander has brought to his doctoral work on urban food security in Havarone. Um, before I turn things over to Alexander, I wish to set out the context and the rationale for our research. So Africa is entering an urban age. In Southern Africa specifically, the region has had the highest rate of urbanization in the world over the past few decades. Uh, indeed, urbanization in the region has rapidly and substantially changed the lives of people in Southern Africa. Some 40% or 373 million people are already living in cities. This is expected to rise to 50% by 2025 and 66% by 2050. And urbanization has been recognized as the most dominant demographic process in recent decades, according to, for example, the World Food Program, who stated this in 2002. We're starting to see emerging, albeit limited, research that reveals that the urban context changes food dynamics relative to what we know about rural settings. For example, we have changes from subsistence to commercially acquired foodstuffs. We have changes to processing, storage, and retail regimes. In particular, in particular we have supermarkets and fast food chains um, blossoming in the region. 
Um, we also have, we're seeing changes to food pre preferences and consumption patterns, in particular the increase of wheat, uh, dairy, prepackaged and processed foodstuffs. We see changes to lifestyles that now require um, more uh, convenience foods to accommodate jobs, transportation and sort of commuting patterns and social activities. And we're also seeing changes in social networks and household composition and dynamics that require and reshape food needs and acquisition strategies. We're also seeing mounting evidence that um, food crises are increasingly urban or take on particular urban characteristics. For example, we saw rising market prices of uh, imported wheat and rice in 2008 that generated quite a bit of social unrest and rioting in several West African cities. There was no reported car, uh, crop failure or production loss associated with this crisis, rather it was the broader global food uh, system that had become inaccessible to urban dwellers. Food, sec food security in this context has become necessarily urban. Our interest has been then in investigating more in depth everyday life in urban Southern Africa and particularly highlighting how food works in cities. So beyond recognizing this context of Africa's urbanization and food-related dynamics, um, our goal is to move beyond bias in academic research and in development practice, development practice to reconceptualize both food security and urban issues. Food security has long been a development issue for Sub-Saharan Africa. The common characterization posits African food insecurity as a challenge affecting rural populations and having to do with agricultural production. This runs as a lightning teeth through international, national, and regional agendas, and you can see this in the documents and the, uh, the protocols of uh, the FAO, the World Bank, uh, the Millennium Development Goals, and the New Partnership for Africa's Development, philanthropic organizations, as well as research uh, institutions. This rural and agricultural production bias, we argue, masks the changes taking place in Southern Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa because of urbanization. Uh, and urban food security has remained for a long time and still remains quite invisible to researchers and policymakers. This was initially argued by the likes of Rakodi and Samuel in the 1980s. It was taken up by people such as Mujo, Maxwell, and others, including myself in the 1990s and the 2000s largely interested in urban agriculture issues in Africa. And more recently, it has been restated uh, by Crush and Frayne um, in regards to urban food security more broadly. So we have little conceptual understanding then of food availability, access, and consumption in cities, and this is detrimental to our understanding of the circumstances and experiences of millions of Africans, and certainly um, is detrimental to our ability to address food security um, in a broader sense. <coughs> Urban issues in the African context have been primarily couched within what we, uh, what we term a crises discourse. Most, uh, and not necessarily unwarranted attention, is devoted to topics such as overcrowding, uh, unemployment, lack of social services, poor infrastructural provisioning, um, and general disorder and chaos in African cities. Um, there's little recognition uh, or consideration regarding innovation, creativity, agency, and dynamism in African cities. Um, I found this within my urban agriculture research, uh, about a decade ago now, um, whereby in southern Africa, the phenomenon was characterized as very much a subsistence-oriented household survival strategy uh, born out of urban crisis. There was no other choice but to do urban farming. Uh, few researchers explored alternative forms and functions of urban agriculture or looking for different explanations of how it worked. What happened is that it masked major contributions that were being made by um, uh, urban food entrepreneurs to urban markets um, and prevented appropriate and supportive programming for commercially based urban agriculture producers who were actually feeding cities. So through the research um, that we're presenting today, we wish to reconceptualize food security as well as urban issues, um, both of which being more complex and dynamic than often portrayed by research institutions and through development agendas. Uh, we are certainly not alone in our endeavors, although sometimes it feels like it. 
Um, but we're part of a broad network um, called the African uh, Food Security Urban Network, or AFSUN. This is led by Queen's University uh, in Canada in partnership with University of Cape Town in South Africa. One of the major endeavors behind AFSUN has been to conduct a baseline study of almost 6,500 uh, 6, low-income households across the Southern African region. Uh, the major findings stemming from this, and the publications are out for 2009, 2010, and 2011, and you, they can be found on AFSUN's website. Um, the major research findings coming out of this is that 77% of those 6,500 uh, households uh, reported conditions of food insecurity, Four out of five households surveyed um, noted that they had been negatively impacted by food price increases. And the study also find, found that while food supply for cities was adequate, um, there was much inequality and generally poor quality of foodstuffs um, that people were able to access. This has become, um, in our eyes, in AFSEN's eyes, a major policy and development challenge for the region. And we're hoping to address some of these challenges through not only the baseline study, but also in-depth case -like studies like the ones that um, Alexander's doctoral research has focused on. Um, and we've also been involved in some capacity building endeavors in the region. Urban food security beyond Aston has also drawn attention from the FAO that designated this as the century of cities. Uh, we also see more attention by UNDP, um, World Food Program, as I mentioned, as well as others that have been stable in the um, in the um, urban food areas such as IDRC and the Resource Center for Urban Agriculture and Food Security out of the Netherlands. So researchers and development practitioners alike are starting to recognize that at a time when, uh, when humanity is increasingly urbanized, attention to food security in African cities is paramount. Let me take you for a few slides to Botswana. Uh, which is a landlocked country located in southern Africa, approximately the size of Manitoba, which is 600,000 square kilometers. Uh, the landscape usually looks like this, or much of it does. Uh, flat, semi-arid brush. 70% uh, of the country is, um, is uh, covered by the Kalahari Desert, um, but you have some spectacular features in the country, of course, the Okavango Delta, and some amazing wildlife. There are two million people that live in Botswana, um, so it's very sparsely populated, and it's known as having the most no, um, mobile, non-nomadic population in the world. And what does that mean? It means that on a very regular basis, Botswana will move between uh, rural villages, uh, plowing fields, their cattle posts, and increasingly um, to their urban homesteads, and they'll move through these four spaces on a weekly or bi-weekly basis. Botswana has long been known as the gem of Africa based on its political economic uh, context. It gained independence in 1966, uh, happened to find diamonds in 1967, and um, has grown to be one of the strongest economies in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. It has a per capita GDP of 15, just under 15,000 US dollars, um, so it's a moderately um, wealthy country. Um, and that uh, wealth has been based both on diamonds and beef production. There's also um, a long-standing history of uh, representative democracy and effective, honorable leaders that have managed to translate the wealth and profits into um, universal health care, universal education, and some great infrastructure provisioning. Certainly, it's not all rosy. Uh, Botswana has been... Um, uh, has found its own um, number of challenges, whether it's uh, HIV AIDS, AIDS, which has been crippling for the country and certainly for the region. Um, there's an increasing rich-poor gap. Um, there have been many conflicts between the Botswana government and the SAM, or the Bushmen of the Kalahari, uh, largely around diamonds. Um, we're getting our own kind of dirty diamond going on. Um, and a lot of xenophobia increasingly in the media when you go to Botswana, largely because of the influx of Zimbabweans coming in seeking refuge from their own political crisis. When we look specifically at urbanization in Botswana, 60% of Botswana live in cities, and Habaroni itself has been considered one of the fastest growing cities in, on the continent. 
Uh, there are currently uh, 230,000 people living there. It's expected to increase to 300,000 by 2021. And the daily lives of Botswana are very much um, city centered, increasingly so. Beyond the traditional commutes that I mentioned of villages, cattle posts, plowing fields, they're now in, um, wrapped up with urban settlements. Um, you also have urban-based employment that is increasingly revered. And socializing, especially amongst the, uh, the new generations, revolves around cinemas, restaurants, and public spaces in the city. People no longer want to go back to the rural areas. When we uh, focus specifically on food dynamics, there's been a lot of preoccupation in Botswana with boosting agricultural production and looking at food security issues at the rural population specifically. Uh, what we know of urban food security and urban food issues uh, is limited, uh, largely limited to my research on commercial urban agriculture and a few others. Uh, and more recently, this AFSA baseline study that looked at 400 low income, uh, 400 households in low income neighborhoods and found 82% of those households um, identifying as food insecure, especially women heads of households and those with. Um, income of less than 850 pula per month. And 95% of those households were described by the research team as having an unbalanced diet. We find Botswana an interesting case study uh, and valuable case study because it makes us as researchers think differently about key issues give, given its relatively and arguably unique context in the region. Uh, conceptual and empirical lessons learned from the Botswana case study are particularly useful when we're trying to extend it to other contexts. It's in this spirit that we are uh, urging for a more holistic and uh, in-depth approach to food security in African cities. So in light of these contextual details and the rationale for the research, um, we have chosen to explore the multifaceted factors that drive different levels of food security amongst urban dwellers in Haverone. We've done so by assessing how household food choices and consumption patterns are shaped by unequal access to food. And I'm going to turn it over to Alexander now. He's going to share with you his empirical findings. Thanks, Alex. So we, this background was well established before I left for the field. I left Canada in September of 2009, no, in July of 2009, and I went to Botswana to collect data on food security in the city. I was really interested in understanding people's experiences within the city, people's experiences with their food. And so I chose to go in, in more in depth. To, add, to, comp to be able to complement the data that was collected by AFSA. I was not alone in this project. There were other PhD students who were trying to investigate the similar in-depth uh, understanding of food security in, in urban Southern Africa. Uh, my friend Liam was supposed to be here, he's one of them, and he was doing a, he was doing a complementary study in Malawi at the time, and we were presenting comparative studies of that at uh, the CAG in Waterloo. I had to advertise that. <laughs> So based on achieving qualitative, based on achieving qualitative saturation, I ended up with 40 households. And now the, and the house and these households were stratified based on income level and gender of household head. So in total, I had 20 middle income households stratified into 10 uh, male headed and 10 female headed, and I had 20 low income households stratified into 10 male headed and 10 female headed. Now, the small sample gave me an opportunity to really get close to the households. I could really understand their differential food experiences. And through, the, through this small sample, I was able to collect information, baseline information. I was able to have them keep a food diary for me where they collected what they had for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I was also able to discuss and observe these households within the context of their food experiences. So at home, while they're cooking, having meals with them, going out grocery shopping with them, and going out to restaurants with them. Now, most of the time was spent doing this. That's my research assistant. And she was, we, always, we would always go to the household and sit under a shade and have a conversation with the households, stemming from what their activities of the day before, right to their food experiences, and then talking about their income and their daily challenges. 
Now, to start addressing some of the challenges that, that we found within the literature, which was mainly in terms of understanding people's food, uh, food insecurity in the urban in the urban area, in the urban setting specifically, in terms of access and consumption, I started up. We started up, and we decided to try a methodology, and so, so as to be able to propose a way to better collect data on food, on food insecurity in the urban setting. Now, the household dietary diversity score proved to be an interesting methodology to collect data on food insecurity in the urban area. Why? I'm going to show you in a, in a moment. It is pretty intuitive that households would increase their, their, diet, their diet to diversity as they gain income. So a middle income household would have a, a, fairly, a fairly diverse diet, which is made up of more known staples than a low income household. So the rationale behind the diet to diversity score is very, is very interesting and very simple to calculate. Now also, the diet to diversity score is very, is very inexpensive to collect data on. And, we, and I'm going to show you the, the I'm going to show you the survey in a moment. Added to that, the dietary diversity score has been standardized. So uh, many institutions, many NGOs are, are using this to monitor and to collect data on food insecurity. And also, it's pretty efficient. So the dietary diversity survey or questionnaire looks something like that. What you have is 12 food groups and they're pretty broad, and they were based on FAO research in Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, the 12, fruit, the 12 fruit groups are broad in terms of that you could, you have to do context searching when you get on the field to be able to integrate the different food group, the food stuff that, are, that fit within the food groups. So, for example, in Botswana, rather than going to the field and saying, do you consume cereal, you're going to, you're going to do context searching and know the specific cereals that people consume in Botswana. So that will be maize, sorghum, millet. While in, with something like uh, roots, for example, if you were to go and carry out a similar survey in Cameroon, you would say you would come up with different roots such as cassava, potatoes, yams. Why in Botswana it was mainly potatoes. In terms of the, the technical work, the, 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 techni the techniques of using the, the methodology is pretty simple. A yes for consuming zero is one, while a no is zero. So you have a score ranging from zero to 12. And so it's really, it's really easy to operate this, uh, this, this methodology on the field. So the data that we collected in Botswana came up, from the analysis it came up something like this. There was a difference when we looked at the averages between the uh, households based on their income. But there was, no, there was no major difference when we looked at them based on the gender of the household head. And so it confirms the assumption behind the dietary diversity score as a useful methodology in that there's a difference between, there's a difference between what the household, the dietary diversity of a low income household versus uh, a higher income household. Yet, the dietary diversity score, the average dietary diversity of six for a low income household is fairly diverse. I'm just going to give you a more visual account of the dietary diversity score. So if you look at the dietary diversity score for the middle income versus the low income, you'll find that there are more, the more, low, more middle income households were consuming known staples. So you'd see that there's higher consumption among the middle income households of tubers, fruits, eggs, while the, which, is, which is not the same case, which is not a similar case in the low income, within the low income households. So it also confirms that assumption behind the score, the use of the score, in that the score, the score of middle income households is going to be typified by known staples. However, when we look at the variation in terms of the gender of household head, there's not a lot of difference when you compare them. However, it's interesting to look at the same pattern in terms of what people were consuming and what they were not consuming. To summarize that, we found that often people were eating cereal, sugar, oil, tea, meat. They sometimes had vegetables, <coughs> milk products, products, fruits. They rarely had fish, legumes, and eggs. This leads us, led us to interesting questions. Yes, diets were diverse, 
low-income households had an average of six, fairly diverse. But they were diverse in very interesting ways. So what explains this diverse, this uh, diversity, this dietary diversity? Why would a low-income household have a dietary diversity score of four, which is made up of sugar, tea, oil, and maize meal? We need to go beyond the numbers. In order to go beyond the numbers, we decided to draw on political ecology. Here, I'm specifically looking at urban political ecology and people like Nick Henning who talk about urban political ecology of hunger, where you need to understand, to be able to understand uneven access within the urban space, you need to draw on political economic, on political economic structures. You have to look at the sociocultural norms of the area, and you have to look at the urban ecology. So let's draw on these to add some depth to the score. First, as Alice has just mentioned, Botswana has a strong emphasis on the diamond industry. And as such, it's common sense knowledge in Botswana that they should invest in diamonds and import the food from abroad. From abroad. And as such, people's diets are shaped by import staples. So you find people's diets are made up of oils, sugars. While, while this is an interesting dynamics in that they could focus on what they can produce, it's also a very risky venture in that Botswana was previously reliant on Zimbabwe, but the economic turmoil in Zimbabwe meant that they had to shift sources to South Africa. Added to that, Botswana has priority areas that invest the income that they generate from, it, from the diamond industry. The shiny building behind there holds the Ministry of, uh, of Health, and it's a fiscal representation of the investment that the government has made in the health sector. However, there are other areas where people lack, where there's lower investment, in terms of, especially in terms of the, in the, the energy sector. So most of my low-income households would not have energy, would not be connected to the, to the city electricity grid. So the households would tend to consume products that are less uh, energy inefficient, so that they need less energy to prepare. And it also, it also needs low storage. So for example, you find that in people's meals are made up a lot with maize meal, oil, sugars, which don't need any refrigeration to store. Meanwhile, they will buy perishables on a daily basis. Added to this, Botswana stick, Botswana stick with their culture and their cultural identity of beef consumption. So even the low-income households would still consume beef, despite the cost. And as such, we see how culture shapes people's diets. Lastly, in terms of the environment, it's a beautiful, beautiful environment. It's just so nice to stand and look at, but it's so, so notoriously difficult to grow, uh, to grow, Arab, to do arable farming within that and to do any horticulture. And so the focus on the big industry, which is good for this environment. And they've thought that it's just common sense for them to import the rest of the food. Yet, there's caution here when we, when we talk about the challenges of the environment, in that we should not use the environmental narrative to be able to divert investment or research in agriculture. Rather, they should think about the fact that the consequence of using this narrative in terms of that, the more and more people migrating from the rural area where our rural, agri rural agriculture is challenging to urban areas without essential skills to integrate into the job market. The landlocked nature too and the environment, the semi arid environment, also shapes people's diet in terms of the low fish consumption. It's just normal that in a landlocked country like Botswana, people would not consume that much fish. So, to conclude this HDDS discussion and move on to other interesting findings, I would note that HDDS is an interesting and useful methodology to capture food insecurity in the urban area. Yet, we need to add context to that, to the scores. The numbers are interesting, yet, if we don't understand the context behind the numbers, we might draw wrong conclusions around them. So drawing on political ecology, we can understand the different factors that shape HDS, HDDS and we'll be better able to know the factors that shape household food availability and accessibility. HDDS and combining HDDS with political ecology 
has helped us to be able to understand that there's, there is adequate food supply within the urban environment, yet there's differential access. The findings of these of the HDS raise several interesting questions. First of all, we have highlighted the broader structural factors that mutually enhance and restrict people's diets within the urban space. Yet it's also essential to examine people's agency around their choice. How do people make their choice? There's always the assumption that in the third world, people's choices are necessarily linked to cost. So people have no agency, it's just about cost. People buy food that is cheap and people eat only what is cheap. However, as we have shown in the case of beef, where low-income households would still consume beef despite the cost, there's quite, there are questions around that assumption. And it's true that even when you search through the literature, you have to find people doing research about, around people's choice. So all of what we're saying is all about, is all assumptions. Secondly, there is a, there's a new and growing literature on the transition within, the, within urban sub-Saharan Africa. So there's the assumption that there's a transition of diets from, a tradition, from traditional diets to more modern diets. Yet, some researchers have proposed that even within urban areas where they've had exposure to Western diets and Western cultures, people still consume traditional diets. So we need to examine all of these questions. I'm just going to pause here to go back to my data, to my methodology. So, in order to collect data on food choice and consumption, what I did was to, administer, to have the households keep a seven-day food consumption diary. So for seven days, all the households recorded what they had for breakfast, lunch, and supper. Now, by the end of the seven days, I had a rich set of data. But what was more interesting for me was the fact that households were more reflective about their choice. Households could speak to why they made certain choices on certain days. And, that was, and I was able to analyze the data to come up with five different factors that shape choice. First, cost. There's an interesting saying that I kept hearing over and over when I was in Botswana, Marike Matata, money is a problem. All the households told me that money was a problem. Money was an issue why they chose what they were eating. Understandably, with a papaya costing close to two dollars, yeah, you understand why you wouldn't want to buy, you wouldn't want to eat fruits. With four, with about four potatoes costing of about a dollar, you would understand why very only middle income people access uh, access potatoes. And so, also knowing that eighty percent of the households, eighty uh, percent of the food in Botswana is imported, cost generally came up as a very important factor why people, how people were choosing their food. Coupled with cost is what we term commercial, which were advertising and pricing strategies that were used by the, by the food industry, by the foods, uh, food sourcing sector. So grocery stores, grocery stores and food chains would have flyers like these ones, like the ones that would go into no frills or food basics and pick up. And people were very keen on looking at those flyers to see where the cheapest deal was in town. Coupled with that, there was also another weekly magazine which was called The Advertiser, where people, you find people really keen on reading them and knowing where they could buy the cheapest food in town. Also, the grocery stores made their sales to coincide with the monthly payout. So at the end of, at the, end of the month, at the end of the month, the last week of the month, leading to, and, and, and going into the, next, the first week of the next month, household uh, grocery stores would cut down their prices. And as such, the grocery store is really crazy. So we recommend not to go to a grocery store if you visit Botswana over the month and pay out. So people would buy a lot of food at the end of the month and stock up on those non-perishables. So you find that people's, people constantly have zero maize meal in their diets. So people would always have those non-perishables. Why they'll go to the grocery stores to buy fresh vegetables and meat throughout the month. Now, coupled with the cost and uh, commercial, there was an aspect of convenience. And this was wrapped up around time. How much time, how much money 
you could save from producing or cooking your own food. And as such, people would prefer to go, and, to go into a grocery store and buy a plate like this one, which is made up of maize, beans, and beef, which, is, which are all cooked. And they're all energy intensive meals. And as such, by buying it for $3, you save up on the gas, the time to prepare that meal. So convenience was wrapped up, interestingly, around the time and level issue. And if we started seeing where cost was not the, the main motive around buying, around food consumption, around choice. Because this was much more expensive than actually preparing the meal in a funny way, in that it was expensive in buying, it, in buying that consistently. But it was, time, it was time and money, it was time and energy saving in the long run. Couple with, with that, there were interesting ways that people, that people shape or people define convenience. So for example, a household, would, a household head would tell me that she would rather buy rice than buy maize meal, even though rice was much more expensive than maize meal, because she could, at the household level, they could consume rice with anything. They could consume rice with ketchup, with mayonnaise, they could, pre they could, make a, they could prepare a soup to eat the rice with, but if they have maize meal, they have to eat it with beef and vegetable. And as such, we see how convenience also trumps cost, if we're just looking at cost in the phase five uh, of maize meal versus rice. Another aspect that also trumped cost was culture. We've talked about beef, and I'm just going to say, Botswana loved their beef, period. Even though they have been able to achieve self-sufficiency in poultry production, they still love beef. There, were more, there was much more beef consumption in my diaries than chicken consumption, even though chicken is much, more, it's much cheaper than beef. And the beef in Botswana tastes really good. <laughs> Another aspect that also trumps cost, and that shaped people's, uh, people's choices, food choices, was class. Where you eat and what you eat. It was interesting when I got to Botswana, I was trying to find out why there has been that shift from sorghum to maize meal. And it was interesting when I was told that the aesthetic appeal of maize meal, which you see on the lower slide, the whitish paste that you, the whitish pudding that you produce, was better than sorghum, which is a brownish, yucky one at the top. <laughs> but it really tastes good. But People still insist that as Botswana became more modern and more urbanized, people started atta attaching aesthetic appeal to what they were eating. Now, this aesthetic appeal also goes to where you're eating. In such, such that when I was in Gabs, when I was in Botswana, in Gaborone, it's just called the font name, they call it Gabs. When I was in, in Gabs, people would go and eat in certain places. The Riverwalk Mall, for example, had a really nice Italian restaurant. This is the picture down here. And people would like to be seen eating there. On the other hand, a place like Chicken Licking, the other one, it's a normal chicken and chips joint, which everybody goes there. So there's no aesthetic appeal, there's no, you need to be seen eating there, attached to it. And so we see in interesting ways how what you eat, where and where you eat really matters, and it matters beyond the cost. So, shaped by all these five C's as we fondly call them, cost, convenience, commercial, culture, and class. People make really interesting choices, which are dynamic and often unstable. And this leads people to consume foodstuff that are sometimes neither traditional nor modern. Most of the time, it tends to be a hybrid of the two. So despite the fact that Botswana is modern, urbanizing society, with an upwardly mobile population, people still have an allegiance to the traditional Setswana diet. But what was most interesting was the way they were blending the two, such that in the picture which was taken by my friend Lee and when he was visiting me, you'd find a KFC joint close to where they were serving traditional food. And this was a physical representation of the hybridizing nature of consumption in Botswana and life size in general. And we, explain, and we, and we think that if more people could do in-depth studies in, in cities in Sub-Saharan Africa, this is what you start to notice. To wrap this 
household food choice and consumption discussion. I'd like to propose that people, I'd like to reiterate and propose that people should focus more on in-depth studies that look at food experiences in Sub-Saharan Africa in a holistic way. In doing, by doing this, we have been able to, to show that people's choices are based on cost, commercial, convenience, culture, class. And we've been able to also note that people's diets are not necessary in a transition. Rather, they are hybridizing. Now, if most of you here who do food security work would agree with me in that food security is not only about people having enough or sufficient access, but it's also about people having access to diets, to, to foods that meet their dietary needs and preferences, then we need to understand how these diets are blended. And we also need to understand the factors that are shaping this blend. I'm just going to hand over back to Alice to tie the loose ends. <laughs> I don't think there are any loose ends. <laughs> so I just wanted to summarize um, some of what Alexander has said um, and what Alexander's research reveals. Um, and in fact, some of what he um, showed was that it confirms the Afsan baseline study that food is readily available in Haberoni and households are recording moderate dietary diversity scores. Um, yet at the same time, urban diets um, of those studies are very much unbalanced and they're dominated by certain food steps that sort of counter some of our uh, assumptions that we've come into the research with. And Alexander explained these different um, imbalances in diets in terms of broader political, economic, sociocultural, and ecological factors. Further complexity is added to this when we understand um, that un urban diets are, um, uh, are shaped by those five Cs, the more than economic factors. And that urban diets are comprised of foodstuffs reflecting traditional modern hybrids. Through this research, then, we advocate for food security studies that are holistic, conceptually, and methodologically in-depth. Um, this means that we need to recognize the urban context of food security, not just the rural and agricultural production elements, and that we need to recognize that African cities are necessarily complex, dynamic, with agency, and are indeed hybridized, rather than always seeing them as in crisis. Um, through this research and taking these, uh, this kind of a framework helps us understand better how food works in African cities and we can gain more insights on Africa's urbanization and urban dynamics, particularly around food issues. And through these research endeavors, we're hoping to contribute to more appropriate and effective development interventions that are trying to address food insecurity in Africa. Assumption that that 
food, that people's diets are transitioning. So people's diets are becoming more modern wheat, rice. So let's focus on the areas where we can produce lots of rice and ship it to those areas. Or let's focus on the wheat production areas and ship it to those countries. Rather than really understanding how people's consumption patterns are in those areas. So I think that's the one part where it's almost a shift in logic on how they're doing research in terms of what are people's experiences of food insecurity. Then let's bring a policy rather than we need to increase production, we need to feed the 9 billion people. Yeah. But, so, 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 so I like the definite approach, increase production. But the, so first, you never talk about food security, but I didn't see a definition of food security. So I don't, when you say, I don't know what you mean here, actually, by food security. So, uh, well, so, yeah. food security. so the, when you found it was Havaroni, if you go to Accra, the capital of Ghana, where I come from, you find the same thing. So for me, I think that the more important thing is vulnerability, mm -hmm. that you, that it has this is a risk factor to you that you may not get food to eat. I think that is in a sense important. And what you're doing is this is just on a, a higher a, a second level. But the so I'm focused on food security in rural areas, actually. I'm worried about it, but because you don't have a, a crack, it's very possible. People are they are going to clap, they're holding, they're cheering, they're eating, they're fine. Right? Out of the rural areas, where there's a rich there, incomes are low. That's what I'll focus on. Um, which, is, which is interesting too, I'm from West Africa, actually. So when, when you talk about Accra, I, I have friends who are from Accra, and I, when you talk about Accra, I think about Duala, I think about big cities in Cameroon. And it's interesting how much people are moving to those areas, how people are moving to urban areas. Now, the other interesting thing, the other interesting dynamics around, around uh, urban food insecurity in sub-Saharan Africa is a double burden, that people are food insecure and they're getting obese. People in those cities, people in cities like Duala, well, what are they consuming? They can go out and they have money, they can eat a lot of beef, they can go now to KFC and all the rest, they can eat a lot of that, and they have a more sedentary lifestyle. In the rural area, a grandma will go to the farm, she'll be fit, she might not have enough beef to eat, but she'll generally have a, a fairly good diet that keeps her living longer than, than myself. We worry about the rural area. I worry a lot about the rural area. But I'm increasingly seeing that shift in that a lot of people, a lot of people in West Africa where you can, would move to the urban area and make a lot of money and send remittances into the rural area. People in the rural area are starting to live a better life than the urban area. So that my issue is also related to that risk factor that you're talking about, the vulnerability in the urban area. People are vulnerable not only to food insecurity in terms of being hungry, they're also vulnerable to pollution in terms of there's no enough water, there's no good quality food. So there's a huge issue to around vulnerability which needs to be understood. Okay. Um, that's one last question, I want to keep this short. Yeah. That's why I think the discussion jumps all over the place in terms of what food security is. If you're concerned about obesity and stuff like that, and you're going to start saying the U.S. is fully insecure, right? If, that, if, if that's the which, 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 right? which, which, so which is, so I think yeah. which you're right, because yes, what, what is the, the, definition, the definition of food, food security is that people have access to food that meets their dietary needs and preferences. That's a broad definition of food security. So food security is not only about availability, it's not about quantity, how much am I eating, it's about the quality also of what I'm eating. So if we have to agree, or we have to enhance, we have to embrace that full definition, which FAO itself gives. If we have to embrace that full definition, then we have to also look at obesity, because in the state, that's what they're looking at. They're looking at how food insecurity is blending with obesity. Most of the food insecure people are obese in the states. That's the fact. <laughs> chicken for beef, for, for meat rather, right? chicken for the flesh, <laughs> sorry. It's chicken for the flesh, not for, not for egg production. But the other thing too is that I found 
eggs in the shops. But people, it's not, it's not attached to it. So traditionally, they have, they have the Setswana chicken, which was running around, and it's, they, they keep it for the flesh. It produces lots of chicks, and then they eat the flesh, not the eggs. So I think there's a cultural aspect, which is also wrapped up with that consumption of eggs. So there is a, an interesting relation there. There's those eggs in the shops, for sure. But it's also about what people eat the eggs with. So I'm not, in my diaries, I didn't find a lot of eggs. But it was interesting the way people would eat eggs. So I had one lady who, had, who would have eggs and rice and pumpkins for dinner. And it was just weird, hybrid, culinary mix-up. Fusion. because she, she did a lot of work around that in terms of the urban political ecology of access to land to produce food. So that was mostly her work. I tried to focus more on the consumption bit. But in terms of the distribution, it's, it's really the huge South African multinationals that own the grocery stores. Now, and what I learned when I was in Botswana was that due to the fact that Botswana was a semi-arid country prone to drought, when they harvest food traditionally in the past, pre-colonial era. When they harvest food, the surplus is stored. It's not resell. They don't resell the surplus. So there are no traditional markets in Botswana. So they're mostly grocery stores in Botswana. So in terms of the grocery store access, there are lots of malls in gaps that I was studying, but in Havarani that I was studying. There are just lots of malls all over the city. And at first I was trying to think of, in terms of, are people, do people have access, and where are the malls located? Do people have access to those malls? And my initial study in terms of the urban, talking to urban planners and all the rest, I realized that the way Botswana was planned, it was really drawn on a piece of paper. It's not one of those chaotic cities. In such a way that you have a, a residential area, you have a school, you have a park, you have a mall. You have another residential area, you have a school, you have a park, you have a mall. So people have access to food. And also in terms of, although the, the mobility, the transportation system in Botswana is private, but it's really great mobility. I remember when Liam came, he was really amazed with us getting into buses and going to different parts of the city. It's really amazing. So in terms of people getting access and distribution, that's really great. I don't know about that access. Yeah, so. So you're thinking about land tenure systems around food production? Um, the land tenure system in Botswana is freehold land, leased land, like estate leasing land, and then tribal land. Um, in GAS itself, um, there are quite a few freehold areas where people do have small scale commercial farms, um, but it's mainly poultry. Um, so that's the main piece of it going towards the urban market. Um, there's no other commercial production really going on in the city, outside the city. Uh, the government has long kind of been frustrated with its population that they can't grow anything in terms of maize and sorghum and millet. They're really frustrated with a lack of agricultural productivity. Um, so any kind of um, agriculture tends to take place in tribal areas, in those plowing fields I was talking about, um, where people are growing really small scale um, staple crops. You do have some freehold, large-scale land being used um, by commercial farmers, largely Afrikaners and um, uh, local elite, black elite, um, but few and far between. And the Botswana is always coming under its quota for uh, staple production. Most of the freehold farms are beef, and they're exported. So Botswana has held one of the longest contracts with the EU, for example, for decades. It was one of the largest beef exporters until last year um, to the EU. So um, people, the land tenure system is that for freehold to tribal, but people's um, 
use of the land for any substantial agricultural production has been very, very limited. Um, and this is why, uh, or it was one of the things that we've been, um, I've been in discussions with the, with the Ministry of Agriculture for a long time because they keep focusing on agricultural production. They've tried so many different schemes to increase production without um, any success. And there's always critiques and trying to figure out what we could do better. Um, and so it sort of started to raise the question for me and then increasingly for Alexander as to why is that the only focus of food security, right? the agricultural production of rural consumers um, or rural producers. <coughs> Um, so we've been kind of trying to um, have some discussions around the different kinds of food uh, insecurity going on, and if you're a food importing country um, with a fairly, uh, with quite a diverse, you know, low income to middle income uh, population, you know, what are some of the different food security issues that you're facing, and how might that help us extrapolate to the region more broadly, which contains countries like South Africa that again have similar dynamics like Botswana. Long answer. <laughs> yep. uh, so I'm interested in the going out part, <laughs> and uh, so you said that often it was about where you eat, or who, you know, who sees you, where you eat, or whatever. But I'm very, in, I'm interested in, and you didn't mention it at the time, but there will be municipal rules uh, around restaurants and eating places, and so from my experience of going out, there are lots of quadest clandestine places as well, but mm -hmm. food tends to be better, um, um, that people have as a, um, income. So I just wondered about that choice between the street foods, which are there on the streets, those places where you may go to eat, but maybe it's word of mouth and they're escaping some of the regulation and then the regulated ones, and how that fits into choices. Yeah, really interesting question. Uh, I'll just start with a story. I remember when I was when talking about beef, eating beef, one somebody told me there that if you want to eat the best sesua, you need to go to this lady who serves at this place. So there's always those stories around where you eat and where you eat the best food, especially the traditional meal. Interestingly, too, uh, recently, just when I was in Botswana, the new president, uh, Kama, they were trying, the city council was climbing down on street food, climbing down on clandestine food. But Kama said, you know what, these ladies need to make a living, so you have to let them be. So there is regulation, and then there's also the patriarchal way in which policy is shaped in Botswana, where the president kind of always sees himself as a father of the nation, and always, so there's always a confusion between what is clandestine and what is not, and when it is and when it's not. Now, beyond that, the choice of where you want to go to would be shaped by, so the middle income would, would go to some of those really expensive places that I showed in the picture, which are the, as well established uh, Italian style, uh, some of the South African chain restaurants where you buy a plate of food there for, you could spend $100 just for a meal there. And we did that a lot of times with Leah. <laughs> Came in a lot of dollars, so I had to spend it. <laughs> yeah. While, on the other hand, you had the street food where you could spend 25 pula, which is about $4, about $4 for a meal. Yet, even that, that 25 pula is still expensive for some low-income people. And so you have the next layer, which is the people serving the grocery stores, selling prepackaged food. So you have meals being served inside grocery stores, you just go in and one up, as you have in some uh, shops here. So that's another layer, which is for people who have less income. So the other one, which you're talking about, the speciality ones, where it's by word of mouth, it's mostly about taste, rather than about anything else. It's about the quality, it's about the person, it's about who is cooking that food. While in the grocery stores, it's about the cost and convenience. So I'm going to the grocery store, I'm at work, I go to the grocery store, pick up a uh, a bowl of stamper from the grocery store and it will cost me four, about $4 for that. The street food is served mainly around the main mall which is close to the government enclave. And so most of the people who come to eat there are civil servants. Interesting enough. Low income people would not want to spend 25 pula on just that one thing of uh, rice and salad and fried fish or fried chicken. 
So the interesting ways in which people draw on different factors to choose where they were going to, to eat at uh, different times, too. And, and, also, and the clientele for them, those special word of mouth places, could be of all classes. Could be of all, exactly. Could be of all classes. It's more an uh, issue around taste now, around the authentic taste of or culture, a cultural taste that people are seeking in terms of going to eat sesua at a particular lady's place. No, no speciality place will have rags because everybody could have rags. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Alex, thanks a lot for your question. I have a question for you and also for Ali. Um, I grew up in Lagos. Yeah. Unofficially, the population is 25 million. Um, and I also lived in a rural area up north. I want to tie my question to the question of vulnerability that was raised by the economy. Yeah. Your research, is it focusing on the urban poor? those that are sometimes called fringe villagers. You might be in the city, but your lifestyle replicates what's going on in rural areas. What's the situation, the plight of the urban poor in Gabon? Those are the lower cadres. Uh, Alice, you mentioned the issue of productivity challenge in Botswana. Is it a problem of Dutch disease? Is it Dutch disease? Is it because they're getting so much money from diamond they can easily import? Or is it a problem of distribution as somebody mentioned? Because in a country like Nigeria, I would argue, well, I live in a place called the food basket of Nigeria. But really, what happens is that that place produces a lot of food, yet they can't sell it because of infrastructure challenges. Is that also the case in, uh, in, in Botswana? So, in terms of the, the urban poor, I think the one thing that, that makes my work and my life difficult being working in Botswana is that, is that poor aspect. Now, the, the whole aspect of Botswana is not poor. Why study Botswana? And, and it's, it's an, it has, yeah, there's, there's some reasons to that, but it has an interesting answer, an interesting feat. That when I, so when I went to Botswana, I decided to do Cross section, so decided to look at both low income and middle income people to see the different dynamics that are within those different subsets of the, of, uh, of the population. Within the low income households, they have huge issues around access, so huge issues around access to electricity. So even if you have the food, how do you cook the food? How do you preserve the food? So there are huge issues around the issues around housing access, issues around sanitation. On the other hand. The middle income households have issues around the type of food that is available within Botswana because Botswana is importing all of that food. So the interesting dynamics that each of the different groups face. In terms of urban poverty in relationship with the rural people, Botswana, Botswana generally live a transient lifestyle in such a way that a middle income person on a weekend will, end, will get into his four by four and drive to a rural village for one act to visit his uh, cattle post, to visit a rural family, for a funeral, or for any other thing. The, the difference is just that a poor person might not have money to go to a rural area, and might not be able to go to, the, to, to be able to access resources that are within the rural area. Now, in terms of living the rural lifestyle, it's really challenging, because Botswana doesn't really have slums or areas that people could live a more rural type lifestyle within the city. Most of what, uh, what they had, which was a slum, and I went there, trust me, I'm from Douala, I don't know what a slum is. <laughs> it's not really a slum, and the government is trying to invest a lot of money into that area to make the area up to standard. So they have water, they have access to water within that area. They have electricity, they have the electricity grid that you, you, to be able to access it, you need a lot of money to access it, so people don't have it. Uh, people, those people in the slums still go to a grocery store to buy food. They don't have a differential access. They're not, they don't have markets like we in, from West Africa would know that a low-income person would go to. So you're right in terms of that. Low-income people have a huge uh, fact, uh, issue around their vulnerability to food insecurity, which is important to recognize and it's important to, to know. Yet on the other hand, to just being an urban resident opens you up to the whole 
experience of food insecurity, which is wrapped up, which stretches from production right through to consumption. In terms of explaining uh, the low productivity in Botswana, there are many theories out there, one of which is um, uh, dependency, this idea that the population at large is dependent on government handouts and is dependent upon, or sort of uh, putting its faith in the government that has generated a lot of wealth from diamonds that it's going to support its farmers. Um, and this idea has been wrapped up with a lack of um, uh, enthusiasm around farming because uh, there's no need to get your yield because the Botswana government is going to bail you out. So that's certainly been one of the theories. That's why agricultural production schemes that have tried to boost any kind of surplus, well, actually reach a surplus, let alone, or reach kind of a threshold, that, let alone get a surplus, have failed. Um, so that has been one of the um, major explanations for agricultural productivity. Question over here, too. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say that was a really interesting talk. Uh, and I'm wondering if, in your the interviews that you did with people, if you ever got a sense of uh, preferences in terms of production. So Carol was asking about preferences about where you eat, but I wonder if people ever talk about uh, where what they eat is coming from. I mean, and I prefer to get you know my beef from this place versus this place, and, and how that comes into the the story around food security. Uh, yeah, that's really interesting because when I was living here, I used to chat a lot with Phil and we talk about local food in Canada and all that aspect of people's preference based on where the food is coming from. But in, in Botswana, when I started talking to people and trying to find out whether there is an issue around their food coming from South Africa, people seem to, people always said to me that it's just common sense. They have no choice, right? The food has to come from somewhere. Right. And it, it was Zimbabwe at first, now it's South Africa. And so people would not go to the shop and say, potatoes from South Africa? No. <laughs> potatoes from Malawi or something. So it was not really about, but the beef, so what is interesting is, what is interesting now is the fact of government regulation around what comes in and what doesn't. Right. So despite the fact that the SEDAC region has a tra has trade agreement, it's obvious that you're not going to get beef from South Africa in Botswana, because Botswana produces so big. Botswana struggled to get self-sufficiency in terms of poultry production, and so now all the chicken is local. But in terms of people really striving to that local, pushing that local in terms of really what farming came from within Botswana, not really. I, I will add that in my research on urban agriculture issues, one of the marketing challenges facing anyone who was trying to do horticulture very specifically, mm -hmm. Um, they found a real bias that people would go to the shelf and go, okay, Botswana, South Africa, I'm going to go South Africa because it looked better, you could get greater quantities, you kind of trusted it more, yeah. and there was a real PR issue around local, that 100 mile diet was really suffering because people wanted, it, it sort of linked to that class issue that Alexander had brought up, people want to be seen buying certain things and sort of linking to that, and not trusting the local because they have no history in horticultural production. Um, so it's an interesting dynamic, but didn't come out in Alexander's study, per se. Oh, My question uh, relates to the context that uh, Alice presented. And you had a graphic that you addressed, uh, which was biased research and development agendas. And uh, I accept that the research you're referring to had a particular foci and particular perspectives. But the label and the language invited the uh, thought that there's research that is unbiased. No, and no, 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 right. is that I'm, I'm just wondering what that <laughs> might be. Is that a rhetorical question? <laughs> I was, just to clarify, I was um, trying to emphasize the point there that we were trying to correct a bias that we've seen in food security and urban issues research. Um, so that was the bias, that it was preoccupied with and privileging agricultural production, rural populations, and crises. That was the bias I was talking at. Uh, talking about. And we'll move on. So. <laughs> I'm not waiting for okay, okay, maybe, maybe a question. question. Maybe, 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 maybe,
obviously in the future at some point you talk about this research, but the future of the question, entry points, how do you, I mean, if, if these uh, individuals in the Ministry of Agriculture have been colonized by this biased research uh, about food security being about this particular thing about access and not about dietary diversity, where is the entry point for this research? I mean, is it, is it with the domestic ministries? Is it with international organizations and all the baggage that's associated with that? I mean, how do you take this, this great research from, from this dissertation project into some sort of strategy for engagement? I think the, I think for me, I think the good, the good starting point will be at local level. I think when there will be more, the one, the one thing that I'm thinking about in terms of future research is that blend between food security, what people always term food security and nutrition security. I think when there will be that holistic approach where people in the Ministry of Agriculture, uh, Ministry of Agriculture are going to say, hey, we'll be talking about food security, we need to produce more. And people in the Ministry of Health are going to go, hey, people are getting really obese in this country. You guys are talking about food security, what is this food security? And then everybody starts talking together and then they realize that they're talking about the same issue. I think that's where we start making sense. And I think that we start by looking at data in terms of, so when I was in the field, I was talking to people, there was a lot of concern around hepatitis, there was uh, hypertension rather, around hypertension, there was a lot of concern around HIV, AIDS, them providing uh, antiretroviral, the people taking antiretroviral with poor diets, and if not going around to produce a healthier, better society. So I think that will be, that will be a starting point when people start really engaging around that, uh, around food security in terms of people's diets rather than in terms of the quantity that you are eating. Um, I'll add something in here that links to Barry's bias question and then yours. Um, in working with the Ministry of Agriculture, it's really come to, uh, over the last decade or so, it's come to, um, it, it's been frustrating in some regards because of this biased um, development discourse. Um, when I came to do my urban agriculture work uh, uh, at the, uh, in 2000, um, there was so much uh, touting of urban agriculture as a certain kind of urban agriculture um, that I was like, okay, great, so I'm going to go out and see what's going on. And when I came back from the research, I was like, wow, this is not happening. Do you, right? So I'd been going to talk to producers, and there was no backyard urban agriculture. Like people in the Ministry of Agriculture had been told there would be by um, a, a variety of international and uh, regional um, organizations. And then the challenge was to kind of get people to recognize what was going on. Um, so myself and a couple of others in the Ministry of Agriculture were like, yeah, but that's not going on. So why are you trying to tell people they should be doing backyard gardening, when in fact what's going on is you have a lot of commercial producers in and around the city that are feeding your city. Why not try and understand what they're doing what their experiences are and see if you can boost their production or help them out. Um, it's, you know, it, it became a very frustrating battle of discourse, actually, and we never really succeeded in, in um, having the recognition that it was commercial urban agriculture and not subsistence going on. Um, so that's why I'm, I'm quite um, sensitive to biased research, because I think it makes us stop seeing what's actually going on. Um, in some regards, not always, not al and I'm not against the food production. We're not against that. Um, what I've termed as bias, that was my term, uh, the bias, right? Um, but I think it does cloud our ability to see what's going on and to really recognize it, um, because it seems that we're always going for the normative, what should be happening, what should be happening. We need to figure out what is happening, and then figure out what to do around it. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. So I have two questions that are kind of interrelated, and I'm hoping it connects. Um, so my first question is, I'm really interested in how equal are the hybridized and hybridized consumption? Is it 50% traditional food versus, you know, 50% um, urban diets? And the reason why I'm asking is if people are consuming traditional food because of their culture, is it because urban diets haven't penetrated the area as much as they may have penetrated other areas? And then it kind of goes back to my other question is, what exactly is meant by traditional food? Is that food imported yet still consumed as traditional food? And the reason why I ask that is because um, in Lebanon, where I'm from, uh, the Ministry of Agriculture uh, released that 85% of food it imports uh, is the food that people consume. Yet, in Lebanon at the same time, traditional food has not disappeared. And I feel like a lot of the food that they import is used to make traditional food. 
alongside um, a lot of food chains as well as urban diets. And a lot of the food chains have incorporated traditional food in their food chains. So like you'll see a shawarma, you know, place everywhere, but like in a fast food sort of chain type of style. Uh, so I'm just kind of wondering um, what is meant by traditional food? Is it still imported that you use that traditional food? And um, how, and is there like this shift towards, um, you know, greater urban diets like in the hybridized food? Yeah, he does. He does. We just address it. I think I'll start with the second one, where what food is defined as traditional. So what food, the definition, I, I tried to use the definition that people gave me around what is traditional. And also going back on uh, the traditional Sasuana, so I had a like, traditional Sasuana uh, diet book or cookbook that they had a list of what they considered tr traditional Sasuana, so specifically to that place, Sasuana meal. What is interesting is that, as you mentioned, some of this food is being imported. So maize meal is not all produced in Botswana. Some of it is coming from South Africa. And there's one thing that people at the Ministry of Agriculture didn't want me to talk about, was the fact that there's a possibility that there's even GM in that maize. So all of that, it's, it's interesting to look to see how people still define what is traditional. So traditional in terms of eating maize meal, whether it's coming from from Zimbabwe, it's coming from South Africa, was still traditional. Most of the other ones, so in terms of vegetables, so the, what they call the vegetable radish, uh, it could be uh, Swiss chards or uh, spinach, which is coming from South Africa. But it's still considered traditional because they've always had traditional vegetable radish, which could be uh, anything from amaranth amaranthus and other traditional vegetables, cow uh, pea the leaves of pea that they pick up. Some of that is being grown, some of that is coming from rural area. Some of it is just what stuff, uh, stuff that is important. So yes, there's that dynamics around what is really traditional. But since they share a lot of dietary uh, preferences for their religion in terms of what people consume in, in Botswana and South Africa and Zimbabwe, it's still considered, since it's a regional thing, it's still considered traditional. Now, what we really consider modern was the other end of the spectrum. So stuff that is not produced there, was not in the traditional diet. So something, for example, like rice. The rice has become a staple in most of urban, most of urban Africa that most of the time you read in, in FAO literature as uh, a non-traditional staple or something like that. So that will be considered so rice and, and ice cream. And <laughs> pasta and pizza and all those things would be considered the other end of the spectrum, so the more modern. What I try to term as hybrid is it's not really halfway between the two, but rather a blending of the two. So, for example, someone having what I just mentioned, someone having rice and eggs and vegetable relish and beef stew prepared in a traditional way for dinner. That's really what I was looking at in terms of the hybrid, the real, that blend of the two, rather than halfway to a real, like, well, drawing on, I was just drawing on Homi Baba where you talk of the third, third space. So it's really a new diet that people are creating spontaneously sometimes, not really knowing it, but that real, that new diet that we're creating. And it, it was the more, obviously the more traditional and modern, the were less, the fewer, uh, the fewer, uh, in terms of the number of meals, the fewer uh, hybrid, but yet in terms of the occurrence of hybrid meals within people's daily diets, there were a lot of hybrid meals. I'll give you one example. People were eating uh, maize meal with soup. The soup that I'm talking about is this pre-packaged soup that you could tear off this powder and you create it at home, and you eat it with maize, with maize meal. And so it was those type of things that I was looking for in terms of the hybridizing of meals. Well, I want to uh, thank everyone. Um, this has been a very engaging uh, conversation, and thank you for your questions, and more importantly, thank you for sharing your discoveries and, and insights about this. So please join me in thanking both Alex and about beef or chicken, again, it sounds like an airline. Um, I'm afraid we're out of both, but we actually do have other uh, goodies here that uh, you're welcome to uh, stay around and uh, enjoy the conversation.
Thank you. Thank you.